So welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Ellenberg. You can call me Daniel. I don't. I, I do a, you know, a PhD in psychology, but I never call myself doctor. But I appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, so I'm a good friend of Rick's, and just to tell you, for those of you who haven't heard, Rick and I are going to be doing uh, a workshop together in 17 days. Uh, the courage to connect. And I'm super looking forward to that. Hopefully. Some of you will be joining us. Okay, so um, one of the things that really you know, struck me in life is how much I personally have tried to kind of insulate and protect myself from threat. And I, and I thought when I was younger in life that I would develop myself strong enough on every different level that no one, no, nothing could somehow permeate me. I would be protected from everything. Now, I gave up that delusion uh, some decades ago because I kept saying that it, it didn't work. And when you think about it, in Buddhism, one of the core concepts is dependent origination, which is essentially that everything is connected. And so when you think about the absurdity of thinking like somehow I as an individual am not connected to everything else and I'm impervious or should be impervious to everything else, it doesn't really make any sense. Because essentially, if you look at the brain, the, the brain is permeable. You know, I, I have a term I call it psychoosmosis, where we take in all of this information, the sense, these senses through the permeable membranes in the brain, and once inside, they take residence and they turn into characteristics or internal characters. For those of you who, who were here three weeks ago when I gave a talk on internal characters, it's very much related to that, how we develop our internal quality. Now, some of these are obviously what we're born with. We have it, we're born with a certain temperament, but a lot of it is what we learn and how we internalize things in our internal world of thoughts, feelings, and sensations, which is obviously influenced you know, by the outer world. Now, it turns out that there are a good amount of experiences in life that can cause trauma, right? I mean, some people have already spoken to trauma, you know, here tonight even. And I remember when I was studying psychology, you know, many decades ago, there was really this kind of belief that trauma was like kind of limited to a few people, you know, who were like heavily sexually or physically abused. Those were like the rare people who experienced trauma. But I think a newer understanding is really showing that it's the pretty rare person who doesn't experience trauma. You know, trauma is, is a major, major part of life and how we deal with trauma. Now, part of, part of really looking at trauma is looking at stressors. Now, a lot of people will say like, hey, you know, I've got a lot of stress in my life. I've got so much stress in my life. And it's not, it's not exactly like that. When we look at psychosomatic medicine, you know, for example, they make, a they make a distinction between a stressor and stress. So a stressor is something from the environment, something like yells at you, or there's, you know, there's pollution, you know, climate change, there's war, there's you know, a, an abusive relationship. You can go on and on and on and on you know, about trauma, right? But the way that a person actually takes it in is how they, is there a stress level? So on one level, two people could experience identical stressors and actually experience very, very different levels of stress, right? Because stresses have, so it's breaking down the body. Uh, there was uh, one, one neuroscientist who said most, most modern people are gonna live long enough to die from a stress-related disorder. You know? And it's, it's, stress is something that we have to keep working with and keep metabolizing. And so like on some level, you know, what is it, you know, that creates stress, you know, and how do we work with stress? Now, first of all, I'm going to start talking about some of the larger world stressors. You know, and so we're living in a pretty weird time. I, I don't need to tell you that, but I guess, you know, on one level, every time on this planet is, is a bit strange because it involves human animals or human animals, as I like to call us. So we have these large, large stressors, like the change in the national dialogue 
you know, with the kind of increased tribalism and overall hostility. And, and you know, it's it's gotten pretty uh, pretty bad. As I I don't need to tell you anything about how bad it's gotten. And of course, we have COVID. You know, COVID has an impact. You know, in in many different ways, and I don't again need to tell you about that. And the racial unrest, and the George Floyd, and the increased climate change, like that wasn't enough, right? And then we have Ukraine, and um, <sighs> you know, it's it's so on one level easy and um, understandable that we would want to separate ourselves and to not feel the pain of that and the suffering of that. I was watching some news last night and just seeing the bombings and the just, just the, the utter destruction you know, there. And it, I started to cry. You know, it was the first time I really kind of let myself feel it on a deeper level. I've been angry, hating Putin, but just like, just ah, like that. And, and so I'm really, for me personally, my, my practice is to, to some degree over, to overcome hate. You know, I think about the deadly triad in, in Buddhism, delusion, greed, and hatred. I'm not that greedy. You know, I guess I have some delusion, but hatred I really can relate to because I grew up with a pretty hateful father and you know, pretty uh, challenging family situation. I could say dysfunctional, but you know, I, I think about this cartoon I saw years ago where it was a, a conference on uh, functional families. And there were like in this giant auditorium, there were like five people you know, in there because to some degree, you know, like when, when like a client has come in and said, like, I, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. I go like, okay, you grew up in a family. You know, there's varying degrees of functionality, but it's, you know, it's challenging. You know, being a human being and being that most of us haven't learned that, that much about, you know, relationships, you know, and how to be in relationship with herself and how to be in relation with others. It's not terribly surprising. Um, so kind of go like what to do. What do I do? And what do I do with this? What do I do with the absolute complexity of just being an individual human being and living in a pretty challenging world? What do we do? Now, obviously, I think that individual practice is essential to metabolize you know, these stressors. So how do we kind of impact and influence our mind states? So we change our mind, as, as Rick was saying, how do we change turning like positive states into positive states, or, excuse me, into positive traits? You know, what he calls self-directed neuroplasticity was really at the core of practice, right? And so I believe that it's really, really important to start where you are, and, and which is on some level counterintuitive. I think one of the biggest challenges about being human is that we tend to look at the outer world as if it's in some ways related to the inner world, which of course on some level it is. But in the outer world, you know, if I don't like my iPhone, I can get rid of it. I'll get my next one. You know, if I don't like my reading glasses, I can get rid of them. If, if I don't like this glass, I can get rid of it. I can even get rid of relationships. I can, I can change things in the outer world. And it gives us the illusion that the inner world works the same way and it doesn't. So if I'm experiencing anxiety, which I've had quite a lot of you know, in my life, if I don't like that anxiety, and who does? <laughs> I mean, anxiety doesn't feel good in general. Depression doesn't feel good. And the tendency is to try to get rid of it. And the problem is it makes it worse. Now, I, I mentioned, I, I believe I mentioned three weeks ago, something I'm gonna speak about a little bit now because I think it's really super useful, which has to do with what is called ironic processes. Daniel Wegner, who is a psychologist no longer with us, did a, a, a lot of work in this territory about ironic process. And essentially it, it boils down to this. 
that in the mind, we have like an iOS, an internal operating system. And the internal operating system is, is attempting to fulfill certain operations. So we say, okay, pick up this, and it picks up that, do this, do that. But it also says things like get rid of. I don't want to experience that. I want to get rid of my anxiety. And so the operation is set, get rid of anxiety, get rid of anxiety, that's the operation. And so there's also a monitoring system in the mind that's monitoring the degree to which you're being successful in getting rid of the anxiety. And ironically, in monitoring the degree to which you're getting rid of anxiety or attempting to get rid of anxiety, you're actually focusing on that which you want to get rid of. So ironically, you're, you're exacerbating it. You're making it worse. You're making it bigger. Seems a little strange, you know, in a certain way, but I do believe it works that way. And so the degree to which you can really just embrace and accept that which is will be the degree to which you're able to transform it. It's a paradox. But the thing is that we know if we're trying to do it strategically, you know, if you say like, okay, I am going to accept my anxiety, I'm going to accept that so that I can get rid of it, so I can get rid of it, it doesn't work because it's a strategy. And so it has to really go deeper into the process. And so when you think about your own practice, your own meditation practice, that if you can really just sit with and go internal and sit with that, that there are like these palpitations that are here and just be with them, be with them, just be with them and breathe with that. And maybe even bring some kindness to yourself, you know, putting a hand on your heart. Ah, ah, you know, to really allow that to be there. And magically it tends to transform. That's not a simple thing. I can tell you that uh, as a meditation dabbler, you know, for decades, despite being around Buddhist teachers and having friends who are like, like lifelong meditators, I wasn't. And I wasn't mainly because I couldn't stand my anxiety. <laughs> it's really the truth. I would sit and, I, and when I would sit, I would just be like reverberating with anxiety. Um, and, and for some reason, I think it was, I went on a retreat and I just sat for quite a, quite a long time. But when I came back, I just had this determination that I'm going to sit with whatever comes up. Like I'm not going to be attached to having a beautiful meditation or feeling great or expansive or loving or whatever that I would desire, but I'm going to sit with what is. And so over time, as I sat with this really intense anxiety, I had my own trauma, you know, growing up, as, as I sat with that intense anxiety over days, over weeks, over months, over years, and it's been a lot of years now, it started to kind of dissipate, right? And I still have anxiety, but the level of anxiety that I live with is exponentially different, you know, than what I used to live with. And you and I thought about it even in terms of the second noble truth. If you think about the second noble truth, basically about pain or suffering, dukkha comes from attachment. Now, oftentimes people think about like attachment to good things, but it's also attachment to getting rid of bad things, right? And so the degree to which like you're attached to getting rid of pain is what actually turns it into suffering. You know, there's an old saying that you, I don't know if all of you, but I'm sure most of you have heard of, which is that pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And I think about the word suffer. Now suffer, the roots is like suff or sub, which means behind or underneath. And fur is to carry like a fairy. So to suffer is to carry from behind. And that is what I think explains the first dart and the second dart. The first dart, pain is inevitable. You know, stuff's gonna happen, get caught in traffic, you have a physical problem, you have a major stressor, 
you know, that comes in from the outside. There's a relationship change. There was a war in Ukraine. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on and on about pain. But then what do we do with it? We keep, we keep feeding that. You know, there's a, there's a book, um, I'm not remembering the name, but I, I remember thinking about thinking about this quite a lot. That the the zebra is chased suddenly by the lion, and the lion and it is running, 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 and it somehow it gets away. And what does it do when it gets away? It shakes. <laughs> it just shakes off that stress. Right. And it, and it goes, cool, chill. I'm going to eat some grass now. No worries. It's all good, right? Well, what would a human being do oftentimes? And be like, oh, my God, I can't believe I put myself in that situation. What is wrong with me? What a, what a loser I am. I can't believe I did that. And so the pain of the, even if it's a mistake, and think about the word sin, it, sim it simply means missing the mark. The pain of that, and if we keep, turning it over and badifying and wrongifying ourselves, we turn that pain, which could subside fairly easily into suffering, right? And I think that's a, a really big part of how we practice. It's just kind of like, it happens, it shows up, here it is, breathe with it, ah, ah. Now, There, there's another way of really looking at these, these inner characters, so to speak, where, which shows up if it's anxious or depressed or whatever, which is on some level to give it form. And I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was going to do a, uh, a presentation to a professional audience. This is like over two decades ago. And I was feeling super anxious. This is before I was really meditating. I was feeling super anxious. And I remember I was living in Fairfax at the time and I was driving down the road and I just decided to give it a voice. And if you will excuse the weirdness about what you're gonna see, so I will warn you in advance, this is what I did. I had my eyes open because I was driving and I went like, like I, I, I let the weirdness out, like what I feared other people would see me as, like I'm a professional, like, but I'm actually this weird human being and they're gonna see me as the flawed, ineffective, inept, incompetent, useless, worthless human being that I feared myself to be. When I actually gave that character uh, a form just to express itself, it was amazing how relaxed I felt afterward. You're like letting that out. And just think about how weird each of us are, how weird you are, you know, in your own ways. You can admit it, we're all weird, right? And if you were to give these different characters a voice, let them, let them be weird, let them, you're not gonna necessarily do this in public, but at least, you know, do it to yourself and, you know, try and experiment there. So there is also at the same time, a certain paradox you know, with the experience of working with oneself, which is on the one hand to allow ourselves to feel deeply and to go into that particular character, that particular quality, that particular feeling, and to feel that. And if it gets too intense, you know, you know get out of it, practice in and out titrating, and then also not at the same time to really step back and look at the character and look at the quality or look at the trait or look at the feeling, you know, so that you're really practicing disidentification. Because the thing is that when, when these different thoughts, feeling forms come up, they grab our attention. So if you look at a thought as a free radical, they don't exist unto themselves. It immediately attaches to a sensation and a feeling, you know, and so you have a thought like, oh, I'm gonna screw this up whatever that this is. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh God, and you feel this caving in the, in the body, you know, and then, a, and then a feeling, oh God, depressed. And so they all exist together and they congeal. And so if you can practice even stepping back from that and looking at it, that becomes a source of freedom. 
Uh, there, there, were, there was a study done at UCLA years ago where they put people in fMRIs and they really had them practice saying this, I notice there's a part of me that feels anxious. And what I notice there's a part of me that feels depressed, a part of me that, and what they found was that the brain waves moved from the more of the amygdala and the emotional hijacking area of the limbic system of the brain more into the cerebral cortex. It's as if like GABA, which is a calming uh, molecule would like it would be like raining down on the cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So I can tell you that in one of my men's groups, where there's a guy, I, I've been leading weekly men's groups for many years. And I remember one of the guys said pretty recently that of all the practices he had learned over the years, that practice of saying, I noticed there's a part of me has been the most impactful. So we have ourselves, yes, and, and guess what? Who we are ourselves are in relationships, right? We're in relationships with other people, we're social beings. When you think about like the three jewels uh, in Buddhism, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, you know, Buddha would say supposedly at least that of those three, what's most important? The Sangha, our relationships, our relationships with other people. We are wired to connect. None of us are islands. The Dalai Lama said, we humans are social beings. We come into the world as the result of others' actions. We survive here in dependence on others. Whether we like it or not, there is hardly a moment of our lives when we do not benefit from others' activities. For this reason, it is hardly surprising that most of our happiness arises in the context of our relationships with others. Now, what he didn't say in this quote is that so does most of our pain and suffering arise in relation to others. And I'm pretty sure that you can relate to what I'm saying because when you think about the pain that's turned into suffering in your life. I guarantee you, a lot of it has been in relationships with parents or siblings or families or friends or lovers or you know, on and on and on in, in work. Relationships can be challenging for sure. Matthew Lieberman, who wrote a wonderful book called Social, it was basically about how we're basically wired to connect. He said, why is it that the same relationship that can make you so happy for so many years can make life feel like it isn't worth living when the relationship is over. Excuse me for one second. When the relationship is over or, or, or the loved one is passed on. Why have our brains been built to make us feel so much pain at the loss of a loved one? Could our capacity to feel so much pain be a design flaw in our neural architecture? Probably not. Social and physical pain have the same circuits in the brain. The neural link ensures that we will try to stay socially connected throughout life at all costs. So the just get over it attitude that pervades our thinking about social loss is misguided regarding our basic hardwiring. And you think about in, in this culture, you know, in the United States, at least, the kind of get over it mentality. Oh, you had a loss. You're still thinking about it a month later. Like, what's wrong with you? You should be getting over that. It, you know, it's not quite that simple. The reality is that the more a person really, when they do have a loss, sits with it, allows that to be there, breathes into it, the faster it will disappear, or at least it will diminish over time. If you resist it, it gets tighter. And so grief and grieving is a very important part of life. Many of us shame ourselves mercilessly because we feel vulnerable in relationships. You know, but hey, <laughs> vulnerability is here to stay. The issue, it, the issue isn't whether or not we'll feel vulnerable. The issue is how we'll deal with it. You know, when you think about it, like the ultimate vulnerability is death. And then there's, you know, there's disease. You know, it's like uh, the, the heavenly messengers old age, sickness, death. Those are core vulnerabilities. And how do we deal with those? You know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm a strong believer in compassion. 
And I'm a strong believer in self-compassion. I know many people say that, yeah, they should be more self-compassionate. Yeah, they, yeah, but they don't practice it. You know, and the only thing that changes the brain is our practices. And we know that thinking about something is nice. Having a great insight is nice. But unless you practice it, unless you really integrate it, you won't change. Now, when you think about shame, you know, shame arises from a really innocent desire. You want to be seen well in the eyes of others. I mean, that, that can't be much more natural than that. You know, so I'm going to open it up now for any questions, sharing, reflections. Uh, I prefer to, for people to actually speak. I know that you know, Rick is a, you know, looks, likes to look at the chat and everything, but I, I prefer people speaking directly. So for those of you who would be open, willing to share something, ask a question, what I ask of you is that you try to make it as brief as possible, not too brief, but also really think about you, what could be even useful for other people, that whatever your particular situation is, is probably quite universal. And so I'd like you to just think about it in that regard. Okay, so I see Rachel's hand up. Rachel, if you'd be willing to put your video on and, okay. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, I'd, I'd like it if you just talk kind of more general about shame and trauma. And I don't really have a specific question, but I know that those are very tightly linked. So thank you. Right, thank you. Well, shame is a very core natural human experience. You know, we, we all experience shame. And there are, there are different levels of shame, like embarrassment, just being shy and that. But shame is it's a self-conscious emotion. It's like, oh, like even, I was thinking about the Garden of Eden, the whole idea, or well, not the whole idea, at least part of the idea is like they suddenly realized that they were naked. They, they, they were naked before, <laughs> but that like they suddenly realized that they were naked and they felt ashamed about that. Now, I would, I would wonder if that's an accurate depiction, you know, in a way, like is, is shame natural? On one level, you could say shame is absolutely natural. You know, because we want to be seen well in the eyes of others. And, and sometimes in life, we're not seen well, you know, in the eyes of others. And so it's natural. And when you think about trauma, trauma is related to shaming. Because people will, are going to experience some level of shame kind of naturally. But trauma uh, emerges when people are shamed. How could you think of such a, that is so stupid. You are such an idiot. What is wrong with you? What? And so this, this negative energy, you know, that comes out from some people because they themselves, you know, have been traumatized, you know, toward their children, you know, makes it such that their brains become, you know, geared toward avoiding, you know, relationship, you know, in certain ways. And so, Trauma is an attempt on some level to keep the organism safe. And if you think about in the most extreme cases of like multiple personality disorders, right? You know, where a person has been so heavily threatened, you know, that they've dis, disowned and, and, and um, dis, uh, lost the uh, consciousness of, of who they are and it gets split off there. And the split off is really an attempt, you know, to keep one safe. You know, so there's a direct relationship between shaming and trauma. And, you know, I'm, I'm longing to live in a world where we do a lot less of that. And thank you. So I see Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, this has been wonderful. Um, when you spoke about releasing those, the anxiety, yes. uh, when you were driving to a conference, was that spontaneous or intentional? And the reason I'm asking is I do have dissociative identity disorder. So I do actions like that spontaneously and uh, not intentionally. Right. Um, I was going to say yes to, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, I knew enough 
you know, at that time from having studied various kind of psychological systems and know that by externalizing an internal aspect, you can help to free it. Like if you, if you think about um, like a little, a, someone's at the door, okay? Um, someone's not at the door and they knock on the door, okay? And you don't answer the door. And then they go, knock a little louder. You don't answer the door. And then you're banging on the door and screaming, let me in, let me in. That's kind of like those little characters you know, in, a, in a way. And so if we actually embrace them and let them in the door, they're a lot you know, more chill. But if we keep pushing them out and pushing them away and badifying them, they get bigger. Uh, I, I just, just had a memory of uh, when my son was very young, I remember going to Yosemite with him and the ranger was talking about bears. You know, when, like, when people see bears, you know, at night, they're huge, right? But when they see them in the day, they're actually much smaller. And I think that if we really look at our internal aspects as Oftentimes we see these bears at night, and if we just make, bring them into the light, they get smaller, and they actually you can actually befriend them. And in the best case scenario, I think that when you think of even a self-critic, it actually usually has some wisdom in it. You know, and I've I've actually turned to my self-critic and I said, so okay, okay, dude, what what would you do? <laughs> you know. And I've gotten some amazing advice. Well, you know, okay, since you're asking, I'll tell you, you do A, B, C, D, E. And, and they're like, hey, that was pretty cool, pretty good information. So instead of looking at that as, as a villain, as an enemy, as that keeps it to taking it in. Now, I truly believe that one of the big issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion is that we're not looking at internal diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, so it's so easy. And by the way, I'm all for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's not a, it's not a criticism of the of the programs that are out there, with the with the exception that I think more would be ideally placed on looking at one's internal conflicts, one's internal biases that get in, externalized and turn into external you know conflicts. Okay, so thank you, Tony, and I see I see Fran. I'm going to unmute. Hi, thank you very much. This is very helpful. And I think what I'm going to say is going to relate to a lot of people. Um, I wake up in the morning and I have this overwhelming sense of absolute doom. I think the best thing to do right now is to stay in bed the entire day. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not going to live long enough to make the world a better place and and, and shit happens. And uh, so the average little thing that might be something you take in stride becomes uh, more doom and gloom. But right, right now, I think uh, global, I used, to, and, and I have lived in, in overseas, close to where all of this is going yeah. on right now. And I, ha I just am, I, I, I wrote down energy zapper, I find waking up in the morning a huge energy zapper and I'm trying to figure out a way that um, shakes that off so I can, I, I would say, have a productive day, be useful to other people, but I, I find myself quite mired in a way I haven't experienced in a very long time. Right. Um. Thank you so much. And um, I'm sure other people can relate uh, to what you're saying. Can I, can I ask you a question before you disappear there, um, Fran? So what do you do? You know, so you, you have this experience when you wake up. What do you actually do with it? I pull the covers right over my head for a few more minutes. <laughs> yeah, and then? Eventually, I drag myself out of bed. Okay, and, and in terms of your internal state, what, how do you do you work? Oh, that's a very good question. I feel uh, in my body, 
it, it's a physical feeling in my stomach that mm -hmm. feels like uh, my stomach is uh, really tense. Right. And um, I don't have it in my head right. or my arms or my feet, but right. I just have this sense of, uh, and you could see in my face, uh, oh, and I thought maybe I should try making that face. And <laughs> maybe that I would laugh at myself if I if I did that. Oh, this. Oh. So you may want to a couple things that come come up is you may want to amplify that. You know that's what I did when I was talking about that. Uh, yes. Was I amplified? Like that there was this internal thing, and I just you know I I amplified it. And so the basic principle is that when you when, like, for example, if you're feeling tight, you know, if you'd like just tighten everything, get tight, 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 get tight anymore, you know, ah, and then you let it go. Uh huh. You're much looser. Uh, uh, listen, I'll give it a try. <laughs> and, the, and the last thing I want to say is just to really let yourself go into feeling that, that clutching, whatever that is in your stomach. And to sit with it and breathe with it and just be with it and bring your attention there. Because pro probably some of it's going into like doom and gloom, catastrophizing. And if you like be in the body, there's a way that the body, the body can reveal and the body can kind of help let go. And and it is a difficult time for sure. So thank you. You know, usually I'll just say one one more thing. Yeah. I'm the kind of person who always says there's always something else you could try. What, whatever happens, I always say there's something else you can try. Um, it, and uh, I would say in the last two weeks, I don't feel there are too many things I personally can try that are going to help a pitiful global situation. And uh, it, it's uh, the other part of it is, and I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. I feel that it's coming at the wrong time of my own personal life. You know, as somebody who marched in the 60s and I felt that maybe at the end of my life or towards the end of my life, I would feel the world was really right. better. Right. And now I have this feeling that I, I don't have enough time to make it better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I'd have to live till I would be 150 and be, yeah. you know, it's, it's very, yeah. uh, right. I, I, I'm erasing myself, you know, in, in that particular way. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you for your sharing. And uh, I hear you, I feel you, you know, and I do think that this is a time when Sangha is particularly important, you know, connecting with other people because, you know, there's, there's a lot of suffering, you know, going on and, you know, to be able to be in relationship in the midst of it all, I think is really, really important. Okay, so thank you. All right, Gina. Gina, are you there? I'm here, sorry. No yes. um, so thank you. I guess I was want to go back to, I love the progressive relaxation. It always helps, you know, we're so into our head and we forget about the rest of our body. So it helps a lot. Um, but one of the takes, I just want to ask you, you know, I do a lot of self meditation and helping people. When you were doing your breathing in self care, and breathing out criticism and breathing in self love and breathing out rejection. I used to do that too. But I started to think if we're breathing in, if we're breathing this into us, mm -hmm. right? And then we're breathing all that out into the world. And you talked about, um, I don't know if you can follow me on this or where I'm even going with it, but you talked about what we think internally. You know, if we think this, this is going on, right? You talked about embracing that which is in your mind and that mentoring mind, right? You know, you know where you talked about that? What's in here, what you think about, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go back to, would it be better or, easier to say, I breathe in self-care 
I breathe out self-care to the universe or to others no, or no. To people that need it. No. You know, I breathe in self-love because if you come around the backside of it, if you're breathing that in, then you're breathing all that rejection out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that's an interesting point. I didn't, I haven't really looked at it that I'm breathing it, that into the world, <laughs> you know, like you're going to get my negativity because well, I, where's it going though? So that's the yeah, question I'm asking. I'm, you know, I honestly, I've never really, I've never really thought like somehow that could be hurting other people, you know, by releasing it was more of a kind of an internal process, but who knows? But I, I would say that, you know, for, for each of us, find new things that work for us. I mean, that's something yeah. that worked for me. That doesn't mean it's going to work for you. you right. Know, I understand. Like looking at like re- being creative and being open to innovating, you know? So if you learn, if you hear something from someone, how do you iterate on that? So I never, like in my teaching, uh, I'll like recommend a practice, but I'm not going to say like, th- this is the way you must do the practice and you must do steps one, two, three, four, five, or else it's not, kind of, that, that's not nonsense. We're each creative beings and we find a way to work with things. You know, I know for me, I've learned a bunch of things over the years, but I wouldn't say I'm any one particular type. When people ask me like, what kind of therapist are you like? <laughs> You were young again, or you were like, and I was like, I don't know what I am. <laughs> you know, I'm a combination of everything that happened to turn into the being that happens to be this being who happens to be me. Right. You know, there's no, there's no one way. But I, I do, totally agree. You know, and I do believe that the more that you, know, you practice, you know, love and letting go, the better, and letting go of hatred, which is you know, a major part of my own practice. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Tracy. Well, this feels like exposure therapy for me. I have been coming every week to Rick's group since it went online and I've never spoken up uh, in the big group. Uh, it feels pretty vulnerable. Yes. I'm not even sure quite how to articulate this question. But I have been um, in our field for uh, the better part of 35 years. Um, And um, about in the last five or six years, I have peeled away some um, behavior and mental patterns that I developed really early to survive. And the last, you know, five, six years have been really rough doing the thing, you know, practicing the things I preach uh, in a real felt way. <sighs> so, my, go ahead. I'm just, just pretty, I'm feeling, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge your, your courage, really, because as you came up and you said that you know, it feels, it's still stressful, right, you know, to do that. So it took something, you know, in you, you know, to, to step forth. So, you know, just acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a part of me is terrified. <laughs> you know but, but not all of you, right? Yeah. <laughs> not all of me. Right. Right. So what I've done the last few to several years is I have not pursued more of my work, partly because I feel what I realized is, is how overwhelming it's been without me having named it before. Mm. how desperately I want people not to suffer and how much I take into my own physiology and so on. The the question, the challenging part is this, um, and, and I don't know if you'll have an answer, but I'm just having a heck of a time feeling myself resourced with consistency I know how to be there for others. And I have, you know, even beyond those 35 years, I have things in my toolkit because I have been studying this stuff since I was a teenager. My challenge is, is it's so easy for me to flip into the role of empathizer and caregiver. and, And I'm grateful for that, but I'm not quite sure how to balance that. Um, how to, how to keep, how to get enough support that I'm not kind of in deprivation. 
Um, even with, you know, with a limited consultation group I have and things like that, I, I just getting not getting out of the space of deprivation without getting negative reactions, because a lot of people, they don't want to hear my stuff because everybody's loaded up. Hmm. So I don't even know if that makes sense, but that's kind of my, I was wondering if maybe you'd have some wisdom. Hmm. I was, I was thinking about, I just flashed on a, um, a quote, which I'm paraphrasing completely from Jung, you know, which is essentially that uh, most uh, people, uh, when they go into analysis, will, with a modicum of trust of the therapist or analyst, will begin to reveal all these kind of horrible things about themselves. However, they will resist to the last day acknowledging what is beautiful or wonderful in them. And I, I just think for you, and I, you know, I don't know you, I'm just hearing you and feeling you for the, for the first time, you know, but you're a person, right? And I, and I do think that the importance of taking in the good, you know, as, as really as the core of Rick's work, of taking in the good and really having yourself as you would say, be the, have the alms of your own kindness, you know, there because, and so I would really kind of meditate on yourself and sending love, you know, and care to that person who just happens to be you. And you may even project it out as like, oh, it's a client who I'm sending this to, but it's actually me, you know, in some way. So you create a kind of dyadic relationship with yourself or yourselves. And so I, I wish you peace and do, I can just feel you know, you're a very deeply sensitive person. And, you know, as a, as a deeply or highly sensitive person, it's tough because there's a lot of insensitivity out here on this planet. <laughs> I mean, I don't need to tell you that it's incredible. So thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to take you. one or two more. Raul. Um, turn yours off, Joe. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, telling us about uh, this group, Dan. Um, I really appreciate Fran's candor. Uh, um, it, it reminded me of something uh, that I've encountered uh, for many, many years, and I'm not sure where the phrase came from. But uh, it goes something like this. It's always darkest before the dawn. And I, uh, I tend to do that. I'll wake up early in the morning when it's dark. And I start thinking of all of the issues that I have or problems that I have or challenges. And guess what? I imagine the worst case scenario. Everything's going to go to hell. And... And then I, I kind of sock those thoughts away. And then when, when uh, the sun comes up, I think, why was I worried about that? And I, I still don't understand it, but it's predictable. And so as I wake up in the morning at 4 a.m. or something and start worrying about cancer, or cardiac surgery, or whatever it is, um, I, I deal with it. I look at that monster and I say, yeah, that could happen. And uh, I'm going to wait for the sun. And the sun always uh, shines a different light on it. Nice. Uh, nice. So, so, so far, so good. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. All right. Catherine, and then we'll take, just going to take two more people and then we have to finish. Hi. Hi. So um, thank you. I, I relate to everything everyone's sharing and so and I've been working so hard these last few weeks to 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 tackle anxiety and I so I, I more just wanted to share a couple of things that were sort of working for me lately in case it helps anyone else. Um, well, this is my theory. I I sort of think with the state of fear that the world is in, that whatever is bothering us, almost like an EMDR session or something. It's like, whatever's bothering you, it is now coming up in panic attacks about 
whatever, you know, I wake up with panic about one area of life one day and another, another day and another day it's Russia and another day, right. you know, it's 15 years from now will happen to me. You know, what I've just, what I've finally been able to do that's helped is I just admit whatever is scaring me this morning is something that I haven't been confronting. <laughs> so let's, let's just write it down and take one little step or decision towards that thing so i woke up worrying about what if something happened to me and no one was there and and i was like okay so we'll call some insurance we'll just see how health insurance works i haven't done that i was winging it through life um or like and i just find if i look at it like okay the fear today is and let's just take a step of action on thank you because i think that's a really important point because we know that when we take action, we decrease anxiety. Yeah. Now, there, there, there have been studies, for example, on uh, hostages and you know, like the Iran con- uh, contra um, uh, hostages. And they, when they're, if they're free, if they're fortunate enough, their psychological tests are performed. And it turns out that usually about 10% are like psychologically healthy. And those people, and trying to you know dig tunnels or do something to keep their mm-hmm. nervous systems engaged, and so when you take an action, you're engaging your nervous system. Anything, you know, and so it can feel hopeless in many ways. But if you're doing something, you know, as you know, we can potentially make a difference. And the the opposite of just giving up is just untenable. All right. So yeah. thank you. All right. Can I share one little, one quick little thing too, because I went to my osteopath today, who's just a miracle worker for me. She gave me the most beautiful metaphor for anxiety that I wanted to share. Cause she said, if you look at your anxiety, like a waterfall in front of you, and if you, if you try to crash through that waterfall, those waves, you're going to, you know, you're going to get lost or resistance or it'll sink you. She said, the way you get under the waterfall is to step back, take a deep breath and dive deeper. Right. And right. swim under and look at the fish. That's true. <laughs> and you'll come up on the other side behind it where you can just watch it. Nice. And I, I love this metaphor because now if I'm flooded with anxiety, I'm gonna be like, okay, what is deeper than this? She challenged me today. What could, anxiety might be the surface of something else. That's right. That's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank it. you for letting me share. <laughs> Okay. All right, good one, one, one last person. So, Jamie, is it? Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to say something on the geopolitical climate that we're in. Um, I'm a former Marine, and so I've been looking at uh, this decaying geopolitical climate for Oh, God, I guess it's been in decay for at least 22 years. And um, I wake up every day with thoughts of of what it is that I could say or do to alleviate some of the suffering that's out there. And um, that in itself is a form of suffering for me. Yes, of course. Because you know, what do you say? What can you do? There really isn't anything you can do but to care for yourself on a daily basis. So what I've learned to do is to meditate immediately upon waking. Yes. And then I do about two hours worth of Kijong to free that tension that's built up in my muscles, you know, from my body so that I'm not living with that reminder of it. And I find that uh, allows me to go about my day. Great. Practices and physical practices are super important these days in getting exercise and kind of expressing and releasing that stuff. All right, great. Thank you. And thank you all so much for your uh, heartfelt um, participation in this. I think it's a lovely uh, sangha. And I do hope to see some of you at the workshop Rick and I are doing the courage to connect and we'll be focusing a lot on this territory and more. I hope you enjoyed that talk. 
I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.